never been tubing before? Okay, so it's for those of you who are only familiar with the ocean and not familiar with maybe perhaps small bodies of water, I don't. You maybe can tube on the ocean. I I don't want to be a reductionist, but uh, tubes like these giant inner tubes pulled behind speedboats is a staple of Midwestern living. You go to an inland lake, you get dragged behind, wondering whether or not you're going to die as an eight-year-old. Um, it's it's truly a magnificent and marvelous thing to do uh, in the summertime. I distinctly remember going tubing with some of my friends, some of my, my parents' friends had a speedboat, and we would go on these inland lakes, and we'd drive boats around and, and tube behind these boats. And, and most most of the drivers who would drive the boats with the tubes behind drove with a lot of precision and awareness. They, they were very, very keen on having a fun, enjoyable experience. And then there was my dad's friend, Scott Hoig. Um, wow. He knew how to fling some people from a tube. He was a madman behind the boat wheel. And I distinctly remember this because we would spin in circles behind a tube and I would hold on for dear life trying to not be flung from the tube, embarrassing myself from not making it the whole ride. Because, you know, when you're 10 years old, you want to make it the whole ride, right? You don't want to be the person flung off the tube. I was resilient, or so I thought. Many times, though, my grip of that tube, I'd rip skin off my hand from clinging on so tightly, leaving blisters and calluses. In fact, I would so consistently grip the tube that I wouldn't be able to like tube afterwards. It would hurt so bad to tube. The pain would sideline me for the rest of the, the afternoon. Do, do you think I needed a better grip strength? No, frankly, I actually don't think so. I think I needed to learn how to let go. In trying to save a tubing ride, I would lose skin, and ultimately I'd lose tubing time because of it. Today, as we have heard, we're diving into Mark 8. As a continuation of our Lenten series on how to follow the way of Jesus, last week Father Rob talked about avoiding manipulation as embodying Jesus' resistance to temptation in the wilderness. And this week, we're exploring a call to follow Jesus as a call to let go. This is, however, not just a letting go akin to releasing the grip of an inner tube. This is a whole life surrender that takes us to the cross of Christ, an invitation to pick up our own cross, to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Before we jump into Mark 8, I want to pause and encourage us. This whole following Jesus thing, it's worth it. We've spent the last few months and especially the last few weeks articulating that as a church, yes, Jesus perhaps is the best advice giver, the most comforting friend, and the smartest person in the room. This sermon series during Lent, we're operating with this belief. In other words, we're going to consider this sermon series, how to follow Jesus as if he really is worth following. Friends, I say that because today's passage really depends on that belief. In Mark 8, just before our passage read aloud today, Jesus has fed the 4,000 and healed a blind man, both visible signs of God's power through Jesus. Jesus and Peter then have a brief conversation where Jesus is asked his disciples who people say he is, and the disciples' response is, is scattered. They claim John the Baptist, they claim Elijah, they claim another prophet, but then Jesus presses and Peter responds, you are the Messiah. That's in, important. Peter's, Peter's answering with confidence just before our passage today, because then at the beginning of our passage, we just read in Mark 8, right? Jesus is, goes on to tell that the Son of Man must suffer and die, and then bold, after boldly proclaiming Jesus in the, is the Messiah, Peter does what? 
he rebukes Jesus. If you think this is crazy, we don't really have to look too far to find dissonance in our own lives. Let me ask you, how ready are you to accept one thing Jesus says and quickly dismiss another? Does your time, money, energy, word usage, or general love and care for others reflect all of that of Christ or just some of it? I know it's some of it for me. It's not all of it. So why does, why does Peter do this? Well, for one, Peter has an understanding of a Jewish Messiah that will come to rule in power on whom the government will rest and peace in Jerusalem will be restored. Many Jewish people truly believed the Messiah was going to be a militant leader and crumble the Roman Empire and establish the nation state of Israel, the nation state of the people of God. People, Peter had ideas of who the Messiah would be. Don't we have ideas of who Jesus is that perhaps are misguided? Jesus' words of suffering, rejection, and death are not welcome words to Peter. They're contrary to a victorious Messiah he had pictured. And the one that would end Roman occupation under an usher of physical peace, a physical justice, and a unification of the Jewish people. And instead, Jesus said he was going to be rejected by the most elite in the Jewish tradition, by his own people. Jesus is establishing a sharp differential for Peter and Jesus' disciples. He's been establishing it and does so for much of the gospel account. To follow Jesus is not a fulfillment of your own ideologies of who Jesus is. It wasn't the case for the disciples, and it certainly is not the case for us now. Okay, so what is it then? Here's where Jesus delivers his one-liner. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. To follow Jesus was a full submission to a new kind of life. To die to your old life your own ideas, your preconceived notion, your own abilities, your own allegiances, and to learn from, be shaped by, and walk in the steps of Jesus. I don't know if you knew this, but we're reading a book together for Lent. It's John Mark Comer's Practicing the Way. And in this book, John Mark Comer talks about how radical it was that Jesus' invitation to follow him like, Jesus' invitation was, was very, very, very different. In most apprenticeships with a Jewish rabbi, only the best of the best were able to walk in and walk in the steps of and learn from these Jewish teachers. Not Rabbi Jesus. When Jesus invites Simon and Andrew, which... If we need some help here, Simon eventually gets given the name Cephas or Peter. Interesting little connection there. When when Jesus invites Simon Peter and Andrew to follow him, they're not the best of the best. They're fishermen. They did not qualify for other apprenticeships to rabbis. And yet they're invited. So what do they do? They drop everything. When Jesus makes the ask to lose your life in order to save it, I think of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, who leave their profitable business as fishermen, their friends and family, and anything familiar to them for a chance of a lifetime to be an apprentice to a rabbi, specifically Rabbi Jesus. It truly is remarkable actually, to think about how simple surrender was for these disciples. It, it, it almost was as if they really did believe Jesus was worth following. Redeemer, if we want to take seriously Jesus, we have to take seriously the invitation of letting go of our life 
for the sake of finding a new one in Jesus. Maybe that isn't physically dropping everything like the fishermen. Perhaps that's not possible in the world we live in today. However, how, how are we to lose our life, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus in today's society? In, in Practicing the Way, in John Mark Comer's book, Comer talks about uh, a conversation with some of his Catholic friends in which there's a delineation between Catholics and practicing Catholics. This is a delineation that comes from a s- separating a cultural or ethnic category from spiritually devoted religious practicers. Later in the book, then Comer mentions in the time of Jesus, uh, there's two reoccurring groups that get named. There are the disciples or apprentices and the crowds. If you were in the time of Jesus, you were either a follower of a rabbi, follower of Rabbi Jesus, you're a disciple or apprentice, or you were literally anyone else. There was no middle ground. However, in our Western world, Christianity has become, for many, a cultural assimilation or sometimes a political or social agenda or an advantage rather than a way of life. In the words of John Mark Homer, the problem we have is we've created a cultural milieu where you can be a Christian and not an apprentice of Jesus. In other words, we now have Christians and practicing Christians. That's not what Jesus is after. There was no middle ground like that. You cannot follow Jesus and protect your former life. One does not lose their life protecting their cultural assimilation, a political agenda, or a social advantage. Following Jesus truly means and meant complete surrender, allowing Jesus to impact the way you talk, act, live, vote, treat others, spend your time truly believing that his way, Jesus' way, and teaching will offer you the best life there is beyond any cultural, political, or social prowess. In fact, both our Romans passage and our psalm for this morning confirm this, like, good life. Both the psalmist and Paul are talking about the goodness of of God. I'm going to pull it out of our Romans passage at the beginning of that Romans passage. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Folks, the mystery of the gospel is that a self-giving love of God, the Father, has offered to all participation in a life-altering, life-giving kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. That is good news. But this good news has asked us, in order to take on a new flesh, a participation in the kingdom, we reject saving this former life and instead lose it for the sake of Jesus. Not part of our life, not half of it or a quarter of it, all of it. Last weekend at the Jubilee Conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with over 2,000 college students gathered, Cloud Ocho, an Anglican vicar from Charlottesville, Virginia, delivered a powerful men- message on the redemptive work of the cross. In order to see all of life redeemed that Jesus has promised, we need the cross. We need the death to life story of Jesus, transforming the world through a victorious atoning sacrifice. Yeah, I think, I think Christians want to take the cross of Jesus seriously. I think we want to count the cost of transformation in our own lives. I think we really want to see all of life redeemed. I believe that. I've seen it in you. 
seen it in me. But when Jesus asks us to give up our lives as a microcosm of the life-giving sacrifice of the cross, to take up our cross, we become like Simon Peter, willing at first, able to declare, Jesus, you are Messiah, and head turned ready to rebuke at any moment. Folks, there's a lot in this world that needs redemption. I feel it. I bet you do too. This is an election year. Our politics are in need of redemption. Housing prices and general inflation keeps climbing. Mental health struggles compound on one another. Gluttony, food, social media begin to consume our everyday. War is imminent and heavy. Loved ones are unemployed, sick, or dying. When I hold on to these realities as if they are my only reality, it is as if I can feel the skin blistering and pulling off as I'm holding on to an inner tube. It hurts to hold on, doesn't it? But what if Jesus could actually do something about it? Better yet, what if apprenticing our lives to Jesus, fully surrendering our grip to a broken reality as an act of picking up our cross gives way to seeds of redemption? I'm going to say that again because I don't know if everyone heard that. What if apprenticing our lives to Jesus, giving up our own grip of a broken reality as an act of picking up our cross gave way to the seeds of redemption. See, what if practicing the way of Jesus this Lenten season actually began priming us to receive God's kingdom rule and reign as a means of redeeming all things through Jesus Christ? Friends, what... What does being with Jesus look like in your daily schedules? Is it the highlight of your day? Do you set aside time for it? Clearing the things that you have to be with him? Do you ingest scripture in abundance? Nurturing your mind and your heart in the teaching of Jesus? Do you give up your time and your money to the same things that Jesus gave his time and money to? Do the things you say yes to reflect your commitment to following Jesus as well as the things you say no to? Does how you communicate with others, both those who look like you and those who don't, Model your rabbi Jesus. Laying down your life to receive God's kingdom rule and picking up your cross is a transformative act that reconfigures our life. It won't happen according to our plans or even in a way that is comfortable to us. In fact, we may have to die to more of ourselves than we may realize. But the way of Jesus is the way of life. Jesus is worth it. Amen.